All right, yes, so we're in the series called Field Guide. What's a field guide for? Well, you wouldn't dare go into unfamiliar territory uh, with some explanation, with some tools to help equip you for the journey. You wouldn't go into the back country uh, alone without having proper information uh, to make sure that you're as ready as can be. The New Testament book of 1 Peter is kind of like a field guide for us as followers of Jesus. Uh, Peter wrote these words to Christians and churches that were living in Asia Minor in this first century as a part of the Roman Empire, and he wrote them to encourage them and to guide them uh, so that they could live faithfully for Jesus in what was becoming a pretty chaotic world. The same is sort of true for us as well, that these words apply for us today, that even in this world we live in right now, trying to figure out this or that and put all of these pieces together, asking the question, what does it mean to look, what does it mean to live faithfully for Jesus uh, amongst all these things? Well, 1 Peter can be like that for us too. It can be a field guide guidance and encouragement for how to best live as followers of Jesus. And so turn to 1 Peter if you have a Bible. Uh, 1 Peter is located in the New Testament. That's the second half of our Bible. Um, Closer to the back, Peter, there's two letters of his uh, that ended up in our Bible. We're in 1 Peter. Uh, He was a disciple of Jesus, an apostle of Jesus. He saw Jesus with his own eyes. He saw the crucified Jesus and the resurrected Jesus. And so that's certainly uh, encouraging him and motivating him and and under the guidance of the Holy Spirit too. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, we looked at these words last week. Uh, let's look at them again. Peter writes, People who do not believe are living all around you and might say that you're doing wrong. And again, that's just a reminder that as times we're going to look strange, we're going to look out of place, people are going to push back uh, against Christians for what we believe, the, say, the things that we say uh, that are important to us, why we do the things that we do. And so we're going to be accused of doing wrong. But Peter says this, live such good lives that they will see the good things you do and will give glory to God on the day that Christ comes again. Justin was just telling you about uh, the generosity of our church and how we were able to come alongside of Food for Souls uh, most recently. I want to tell you about some exciting news from this past week. You've all seen and heard the news of the devastation from Hurricane Helene uh, in the south. Uh, This past week, we sent a gift of $25,000 from Genesis to a ministry called Convoy of Hope to help with hurricane relief efforts in the South. And I want to say thank you to you this morning because we can't do that if you you don't give. And so would you just kind of celebrate with me that we were able to give this gift together. Convoy of Hope is one of many great ministries that are already on the ground in multiple states, helping people with supplies and sharing the love of Jesus with others. Um, But because I know that some of you might want to do more because you might like to learn more about what's happening there, uh, Convoy of Hope is a great ministry to learn from. We put their information on the screen. You can check it out for yourselves. But again, thank you, Genesis. Like We couldn't do this uh, without your faithful giving, every single one of us, your generous giving. And we know there may be more opportunities opportunities uh, to give and to even help, and so we'll keep you posted as those come up. I want to stop right here. I want to pray uh, for what's happening in the South right now, and certainly if you're following the news, there's the potential of another hurricane there even this week. Uh, I want to pray for them, and we've got a lot of things going on in our world too, and so uh, it just kind of seems like the right thing to do uh, before we continue on, if you'll bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, uh, we trust you. Our, we, uh, we put our faith in you, and we, we recognize, as we've acknowledged this morning, that you're here with us today, and uh, we, uh, we worship you. Um, uh, we, we enjoy reconnecting with one another, and we are expecting and need uh, and hoping for your presence to work in our lives in encouraging and powerful uh, ways only as you can. And we thank you for ministries like Convoy of Hope. Uh, Lord, we know there are so many people that are hurting right now that have lost lots or potentially lost everything. And so we pray that you'd work through ministries like Convoy of Hope and even with these financial gifts that have been given uh, to provide for people, but also that they might experience the good news of Jesus uh, with words and through a gift and, and through actions as well. And we uh, come before you. Uh, you are sovereign God. And as we think about things that are happening in places like the Middle East right now, uh, we, we are trusting in you and we are trusting that you would bring peace Uh, to an area where there is so much hostility right now. We pray for your protection over so many innocent people uh, that are caught up in this conflict. We pray that evil will be defeated 
And we pray that in the name of Jesus Christ and that you would bring peace because you are the only one that can bring peace, especially uh, to a part of the world like this. And we trust you, Lord, as we, even as we talked about last week with everything that's going on in our country, with, with politics and the election that's coming up, that uh, you, would, um, you would give us wisdom as followers of Jesus. Anyone here today, as we think about our vote, as we think about um, how we interact and the way that we respond and the way that we handle ourselves in each and every situation, uh, we pray that Jesus would be glorified in all that we do. And as we continue studying from 1 Peter, would you just use these words today uh, from your word? Would you use my words, Lord, uh, to speak to our hearts and minds? And I pray that our desire would be obedience in all things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this morning, I want to talk to you about your work. Um, I want to talk to you about your job, your profession, what you do with your time 40 plus hours a week, the places that we go, the people that we serve, and why the quality of our work matters and can bring glory to God. And some of you know that about your work. You love your work. You love your job and what you do. You're doing what you were made to do. And not only is your work fulfilling, but you might go as far as to say, you know what, my work is my ministry. This is really the ministry that God has given to me. Others of you, your job is a grind. And maybe you're working in an environment right now that you don't love. You don't love your work. You feel stuck. Uh, You're only doing this work to keep food on the table, to pay the bills, whatever it's going to take. I remember uh, when I was working as a bank teller in college, and I did it for a year or so, and it wasn't really life-giving. It was pretty monotonous, actually. I mean, you, you, you cash the check, you deposit the money. I worked in the drive through Are there even drive throughs today? This is the 1900s that I'm thinking back to. I don't even know if people go to the drive through today, but the most exciting part about my job was when somebody, like a high school friend or whatever, would pull through the drive through and we would take those canisters, and we'd see how many dumb, dumb suckers we could stuff into one of those canisters before ultimately sending it back uh, through the tube to our friend, and, and that made for a good day. Maybe, maybe you're in a job like that. It's just monotonous. Uh, there aren't really any high highs and maybe a lot of low lows, or maybe it's just sort of medium. Uh, maybe you're in a job, again, that's paying the bills, but hopefully it's short term for you. Maybe you're in between jobs, maybe doing one job just trying to buy the time until the next job. Uh, some of you aren't working yet. You're in high school. Uh, You're in college. You know, you're thinking about, okay, what's the Lord created me to do? This degree that I'm in, how might he use this in in my life? And so you're in a season of preparation, of anticipation. Uh, Let's talk about work today. And, And what might happen if we gave Jesus all the room that he wants and needs to do everything that he intends and would like to do through our lives, whether we're at the office, whether you're at the job site, or working from home or school. And so we're going to start in 1 Peter chapter 2. I'll tell you, we're going to jump around a little bit today. We were in 1 Peter 2 last week, where Peter was addressing our role and responsibility as Christians in light of government and our elected officials. We skipped the part about marriage in 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to come back to that in a few weeks, right? So hang on with that one. We'll come back. Today, I want to start in 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 18, and set some things up, and then we're going to jump over to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, for some application. But before we do that, remember that Peter has already established this idea of submission for Christians and what it means to submit in light of things like government and marriage. And I think we all know that submission is a pretty hot-button word inside the church and outside the church. Personally, I think it's a word that's misunderstood because what Peter is trying to show us and remind us is this, that submission is what Jesus is. Submission is how Jesus lived, and it's what he's called us to as his children and as his followers. He points to uh, I, oh, let's look at uh, ch- verse 21, 1 Peter 2, verse 21. We, we read these words last week. Peter's going to do some commenting here, and then he's going to reach back to Isaiah 53 to give us an example. He says this, he says, to this you were called. And as followers of Jesus, as foreigners and strangers in this world, as you think about your life, kind of a vision for your life, here it is. Peter says, because Christ suffered for you, he left you an example that you and I should follow in his steps. And then again from Isaiah 53, he quotes, he committed no sin, Jesus did. There was no deceit in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. 
He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you, all of us, were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And so Peter just keeps pointing to Jesus. He explains, again, this is the kind of life we're called to in every situation, in all circumstances. Submission means taking up the position of a servant. Submission is asking yourself as a follower of Jesus all day long in every situation, including our work, WWJD. All right, it's what would Jesus do? What would he do if he were doing this through me? Which then takes us to these words. You might have read them, studied them on your own, even discussed them in your small group this past week. First Peter 2, verse 18. Look what Peter says. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it, but if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. Now let's stop right there because these words need some explanation or they might be easily misunderstood. Remember, Peter is writing to Christians and churches in the first century. This is first century Rome. Slavery was a little different than what we remember, the horrific slavery from our past here in the United States. In this case, there were millions of slaves at any given time in the Roman Empire, and most were men and women who had a debt to pay, and they therefore took on a position, in this case referred to as a slave, in order to pay off that financial debt. Historian Murray Harris, also a professor, says this about it. He said, in Greco-Roman times, number one, slaves were not distinguishable by anyone else by race, speech, or clothing. They looked and lived like everyone else and were never segregated off from society in any way. Number two, slaves were typically more educated than their owners in many cases and in many times held high managerial positions. Number three, from a financial standpoint, slaves made the same wages as free laborers and therefore were not themselves usually poor and often accrued enough personal capital by themselves out. And then number four, very few persons were slaves for life, most expected to be released after about 10 years or by their late 30s at the latest. Now, this first century version certainly had its own degrees of injustices and abuse, all right, for sure. And, and so I'm not suggesting that this was necessarily a good system, and Peter's not doing that either. He's not doing that. He's not saying that. But what would, should we think about these words? Like what sort of application then might God have for us or Peter have for us in, in 2024? Well, as I've seen some suggest, the best comparison that we have today is our work. It's the work that we do. It's the jobs that we do. It's the career that you're preparing for or praying about. It's the people who report to you or the people who manage you. And, and whether you're in law or school or you work in retail or you work on the farm or you work on the assembly line, uh, uh, maybe you're a stay-at-home parent, maybe you're self-employed, uh, whatever it may be. But I think before we continue, I think it might be helpful if we establish something else about work and the jobs that we do. And it's this, work isn't a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It's, it's a good thing. And, and it's not this necessary evil that just pays the bills. I mean, we're not just blaming Adam and Eve for what happened in the garden and we all got to work because of it. No, we were, we were made to work. We were gifted to work and to be able to contribute. We, we serve God. We serve others through the work, through the jobs that, that we do. Like God has gifted us, and so therefore even our work can be an other opportunity to help bring His kingdom to this world. We've talked about this writer before. Some of you have read him, John Mark Comer. Uh, he's written this book, a really popular book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Well, he's written a bunch of other books too and, and talked about many other things. But he emphasizes that this idea uh, of work, that it's not, work is not just a means to an end, but it's a significant part of our lives. It's a significant part of our spiritual lives. He argues that work should be seen 
This is all things. Work should be seen as a form of worship and, and a way to participate in God's ongoing work of creation in this world. And, and he, so he highlights all types of work, whether it be secular or be sacred work, and, and, and how these jobs, every job, has inherent value and can be one more way that we serve others and ultimately reflect the character of God. And so he encourages this holistic understanding of work, suggesting that our work should align with our values and, and purposes as Christians, but instead of viewing work merely as this necessary evil, Comer invites us to see it as vocation and a calling, a calling that can bring fulfillment and contribute to the flourishing of society. Overall, his theology of work encourages a mindset that integrates faith and daily labor, and he says this, he emphasizes that every task, every job can glorify God if we approach it with the right heart and with the right intention. And if you add to it our own spiritual growth, like God can use it in a very positive way, even our work. I mean, isn't it true that all of life and certainly the trials and difficulties that we all go through provide plenty of examples of, of you know, difficulties and challenges that we all face, and, and we know that God can use them, but He can use that in our work too, and there's plenty of challenges and difficulties that come with work and, 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 the, and the jobs that we do, and so whether you lead people or you're led by people, whatever it may be, like God can use our work to increase our faith and dependence and trust in Him. And so for the listeners 2,000 years ago, I imagine Peter saying, hey, in all things submit, like in your work, all right, and your relationships submit as you follow your leader, as you seek to pay off your debts, submit to this you were called. Take up the nature and the attitude of Jesus Christ who came as a servant. What about today? Well, Peter might say in your work, no matter if it's a job you love, or a job you can't stand, whether it's full-time or part-time, whether it's a short-term job or a long-term job, every day ask yourself, how would Jesus do this work if He were doing it through me? Like, if Jesus had full control and authority over my life, how would He do this job if He were me? I'll tell you, as we get to know each other and do life together. I love hearing stories about how so many of you are doing just this and, you know, how your values and your faith, you're working really hard to bring that into your profession and, uh, you know, seeking to serve people the way that Jesus would serve people. And so you see your work and you see your workplace as a ministry. I had lunch with a dad this past week. He was telling me the story of one of our high school students that's working in a new place and working with people and the managers there aren't Christians and likely a little skeptical of the church. But this dad was telling me how proud he is of his son and the positive influence his son is having there in this place, and specifically with the owners who are just asking him his qu questions about life and church and why he does the things that, that he's doing. Peter would say, that's it. Like, you're getting it. You know, when you even put yourself into these situations, and, and yes, we are like temporary residents on this earth, and, and, and yes, we are going to be tempted and, and pressured to withdraw or to fly under the radar, but Peter says, no, no, let's make the most of every single opportunity that we've been given. Like, even your work can be another opportunity to share and model the love of Christ, the living hope of Christ. And so let's skip over now, if you've got your Bibles open, to uh, chapter 3. It kind of takes us into this week if you're following along in your field guide journal. But 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 15, where he just kind of sheds some light on what this kind of living looks like. 1 Peter 3, 15, he says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Now, to revere something means to hold it deeply in your heart. You're, you're passionate about it. You're allowing this thing to influence the way you think and, and everything you do in every situation. What's happening around the Roman Empire and Asia Minor? You've got followers of Jesus in all sorts of different places and environments and, and circumstances. And some of those environments were, were very hostile towards the faith. Maybe others weren't so much, but add to it persecutions on the rise. There's a lot of uncertainty certainty Christians are looked down upon for their beliefs, but Peter says, hey, in your hearts, always revere Christ as Lord. 
You hang on to that. You let that be the passion and the motivation in your life for all things. This is another way of Peter saying, don't you forget that Jesus Christ died for you, that he gave his life for you, that he has redeemed your life, that he has set you apart now. And remember, remember that this Christian life is so much more than salvation, as important as that is, all right, that's the most important part about your life and mine is whether we've put our faith and trust in Jesus, but add to that that, that, that salvation is the starting point of what God wants to do in each of us, that it's his desire each and every day to help us to transform us so that we look a little bit more like Jesus. And so thinking about our lives then when it comes to work or when it comes to your occupation, like if we're living this out, we're saying, we're believing, we're trusting that Jesus is in control. And even in this difficult workplace that I find myself in right now, even the job that I'm applying for, even the job that I love, like we're trusting that Jesus, that he's in charge, that we're, we're letting him leave, lead us. And, and our goal is to serve as he would serve. And we're submitting in the same way that Jesus submitted. Peter goes on to say, I'll always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, which is interesting because what I think Peter means is that then when you go to the office or we go to the office or when you're out on the floor or we're with the, the customer or even when you're in your classroom or on your campus or, or in your next Zoom call, we should all be sensitive to and thinking, how would Jesus operate if he were fully operating through me? which in turn then means the way we live and the way we act and the way we perform and the way we treat one another is eventually going to cause some people to ask, what is it about you and why you do the things that you do and the way that you operate and the way that you manage? What is it about your life? And when they do, will you be ready with an answer? Peter suggests, will you be ready to share? Do you have a story to tell? Will you have the courage and the confidence to share with others why you live and believe the things that you do? But I know I don't need to tell you that's not, that's not always easy. And some of you work in some really complicated, difficult environments and places, and uh, places that can be very worldly and and sometimes you try and act one way or say one thing or respond in a certain way and it blows up in your face. Or we wonder, does it really matter? Can, can I make a difference? Like even in this job, like this job, like, you know, the job that you're in, you just, you wonder, like, what difference can it make? Like, could God really use me? Do the people around me even care? I was reading this past week about a guy by the name of Randy Kilgore. He's committed his life to encouraging men and women in their jobs while also helping them see how the marketplace can be like a mission field. And he writes and speaks and tells story about personal interactions that he's had over the many years, not just with Christians and, and their experience in the marketplace, but how he also tries to stay very attuned with, with conversations with people who, who aren't Christians, that aren't following the Lord. And, and, and so whenever he gets to the chance to talk to people like that, people that aren't following Jesus, he'll ask them about Christians at their work and their impressions of, uh, of working with them. And, and so he'll frequently ask this question, hey, if you had to pick five things, what are five things you want from your coworkers who claim to be Christians? And more times than not, he says the same five things come up every single time, the same five things. More times than not, he will hear people say this about Christians, their, their Christian coworkers. And, and I put them for you here on the screen. He, uh, people will say this. Number one, they will say to him, I wish my Christian co-workers knew more about their faith. And, and if this is true where you work and the people you serve alongside of, like they want you to be informed about your faith and having, uh, you're thinking through, you're growing in your faith. They want you to be able to share honestly and intelligently why you believe the things that you do. No wonder Peter says, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. Number two, they'll, they'll say, I wish my Christian coworkers had more hope in hard times, like when things, bad things are happening in our world or, or when the company is maybe going through some stressful times. Like it's difficult, they would say, to see, you know, the, see the good, like people that can see the good and, and, and the chaos. They, people want to see your hope. They want to see the living hope of Jesus influencing all of our actions. Number three, they'll say, I, want, I wish my Christian coworkers were more curious about the hard questions of life. Like, could it be 
that the people that you work around are more open to spiritual conversations than we might realize. And while they want to see our confidence and they want you to be informed and they want to see your hope, I, I think our empathy or your empathy and, and, and sensitivity matters to them too. Now, Peter's not saying, no, I want you to compromise. He's not saying that. He wants us to, to hold strongly to our convictions. But there are a lot of difficult questions out there that people are dealing with and struggling with and struggling with at home. And so things like listening and empathy are a big part of establishing trust and respect so that we can have even deeper spiritual conversations about faith. That's why Peter would say in 1 Peter 3, 8, finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate, be humble. In verse 15, he says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. The fourth thing Kilgore points out is people say, I wish my Christian co-workers behaved more honorably. We're not perfect. I'm not perfect. We make poor choices. I have a bad day. I'm trusting that you have a bad day at work too. But just as our kids watch us, people, our co-workers, students that we spend time with in class, they're watching us too. And that's why Peter stresses the importance of Jesus Christ being Lord of all, influencing the way we treat others, our respect uh, of people of the opposite sex or someone of a different race or color, patience with those who don't see things the way that we do, the way we interact and treat customers, the way we manage our finances, like those Around you want to see Jesus influencing all of life, everything that we do, every conversation. And finally, they'll say, I wish my co Christian coworkers were more compassionate. And we know this, like there's so much noise, there's so much commotion in our world right now. And like it or not, many look at Christians and they look at churches today as judgmental or insensitive or out of touch. And so Peter reminds us, hey, gentleness and respect, gentleness and and respect. Keep up the faith. Hold on to your convictions. Gentleness and respect. Always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. These are Randy Kilgore's observations. And as he also points out, notice that few people, it doesn't even make the list, say, I wish my Christian co-workers would keep their faith to themselves. It's not on there. And we can't. We can't keep our faith to ourselves. It's why we're here. It's the what Jesus has commissioned us with. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel every day in everything that you're doing. Like that's the mission that Jesus has given us. That's why we like to say around here, our mission as a church, but as individuals, is helping people find their way back to God. And not just Sundays, but in all things, including your work. Teacher historian R.C. Sproul says this about our work. Looking back to the early church, all right, and the way they saw all of life. He says, you know, the cradle of the church was the marketplace. From the preaching and public ministry of Jesus to the daily acts of the apostles, the central scene was the marketplace. Perhaps the greatest need for our day is the need to market Jesus. He says, the church must become an expert in marketing, but not in the slick Madison Avenue style, but in an aggressive yet dignified way. The marketplace is where we belong. It is where needy people are found. It is not enough for the church to hang a welcome sign on her door. We dare not wait for the world to come to us. We go to the world. He says, the marketplace is where we belong. Again, we are foreigners, we are exiles in this world, but we're not just surviving, we're not just hiding out, we are stepping in, in the name of Jesus, by the power of Jesus, the living hope of Jesus in all things. Here's how I want to end today. We'll wrap up quickly whatever situation you find yourself in, whether you're working right now, whether you're a student at school, if you're a stay-at-home mom or dad, this applies to all of life as we think about work, as you think about your work, whether that be this afternoon or tomorrow or later on tonight, whatever situation you find yourself in, here's what I want to encourage you with. Maybe write these down and you can do, spend some time with them on your own this week. Number one is this, that your work is your mission field. Your work... Your occupation is a part of your mission field. We introduced you to Brandon and Katie Hutchins last week. They attend our Carmel campus and are going to be going on staff with uh, Go Ministries in the Dominican Republic in November. We're going to support them financially as a church, and I'd invite you to consider supporting them on your own too. In situations like these, if you've been around church, you know the church language. We'll say something like, they're going to the mission field. 
all right? They're, they're going off to the mission field, and that would be true. But the mission field is not limited to the Dominican Republic or Haiti or places like Africa. The mission field is all around us. It's Noblesville, it's Lapel, it's Cicero, it's Westfield, it's all of Hamilton County. It's anywhere you live, it's where you work. And that means that your work is a chance to do life with people. And it's an opportunity to work hard and to be the very best at what you do and to live faithfully and to do the best with what you've been given. And it's a place to share your faith and it's a place to build relationships, relationships that can have the potential of changing somebody's life forever. The second thing is this, a change in thinking can transform your attitude. Change your mind, transform your attitude. Because following Jesus and serving Him faithfully, we'll just add this, doesn't mean you have to do your current job forever. And it doesn't mean that you have to tolerate a toxic or corrupt environment by any means. But if you let God, and if you dare see every part of life, including the position you're in now and the people that you're working with as an opportunity to make Jesus Christ Lord of all, these words from Peter and this realization has the potential of changing your attitude for your work and to change it for the good. And the last thing is this, by all means, in everything that you do, don't go to work alone. And that's just a reminder that as followers of Jesus, that we can take the presence of Jesus Christ with us each and every day. <coughs> Excuse me. John chapter 14, uh, just before Jesus was crucified, he gave us this promise. He says, uh, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Who's he talking about here? He's talking about the spirit of truth. This is the Holy Spirit. He says, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and he will be in you. Can I just remind you this morning that if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, not only do you have the hope and the promise of salvation and that Jesus is coming again, but you have the very presence and power of God living in your life. The same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is in you. And that means that he is with you wherever you go, whatever you do, in any and every situation. Don't forget that. Don't forget that today. Don't forget that tomorrow. Do something that reminds you of that each and every day. Post a verse or something, uh, a reminder in your car. Hang a sticky note on your computer screen or inside your, your locker door. Start your day by praying, asking God to fill you with His presence and you remind you of His presence all throughout the day. It could change your life. It could change your work. And it could change somebody else's life too. And that's a big part of the reason why we're here. That's a big part of the reason why we go. And it's a big part of the reason why we do the work that we do. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this reminder today that we don't have to do this alone. That as Jesus promised, that your Holy Spirit, your power, your presence is in anyone who puts their faith and trust in Jesus, which means that we are never alone that you are with us, that you can lead us and guide us and give us words and right actions. We're here to plant seeds, Lord. You're the God of the harvest. I pray that we will be faithful with the time and the work that you have called us to and the people that you have put around us in our lives. Remind us today, Lord. Open the heart of somebody here today that's recognizing that they've never put their faith and trust in you. There's no greater decision than to trust Jesus as Lord and Savior. We want the world to know that. Use us. Use our church. We're here for you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.